Hey everybody, Gary here with Pal Music. I hope you're enjoying this playthrough of Under the Bridge by John Frusciante that he did for the July 2006 issue of Guitar World. I managed to track it down on eBay. And in it, he actually talks a little bit about each section of the song, which isn't in the video. So after his full playthrough, which is like four and a half minutes with our fret live animations to help you understand what's happening on the fretboard. We're then gonna go in depth on each section. I'll read you what John had to say. We'll go more in depth on some of the techniques at play, the theory, the chord progression. And as always, if you wanna follow along with the tab as a PDF or the playable tab, which you could play in Guitar Pro or similar software, that's available for Pow Music patrons and the link is in the description. Also, if you do become a patron, you could join us for twice weekly small group guitar hangouts. We get together on Zoom. We explore these lessons in depth we go over anything you want to go over you could just watch you could interact it's a great little community and an awesome hangout all right let's get back to john and i'll see you in a little while
All right, so one of the reasons why I've been meaning to do a fret live on this song and this video, which has been on YouTube for a while, is because there's just so much illuminated about his style, but also just how educational it is, because John uses all five of the cage forms, and I'm always looking for songs to go along with my fret live fretboard mastery program, which is about understanding how harmony works on the fretboard through songs. So three of the units out of 12 are on the cage system, and here he uses all five cage forms. So C, he uses in the, f the first chord, right? This is the C shape. Looks like a C chord, but moved up to D. Then there's the E shape. Looks like an E major chord, but moved up to F sharp. So we skipped over A and G uses the A shape. For instance, the first chord in the verse. Sometimes I feel like... That starts with an E in the A shape, right? Because here's an A. Moved up to an, an E. And that's all E shapes, except for that one A shape. What if we skip the G shape? Then he goes that shape right there that is an E major chord in the G shape because here's what a G looks like right let's think of this move it up to an E but start on the third and we've got what's great about the G shape is it's so easy to add some pentatonic scale notes to the chord then we've got the D shape and that completes the cycle, right? In the part where he goes. That right there, which he plays in a very unconventional way. I didn't even think that was humanly possible until I saw him do it. So for those of you that are still a little confused by what I mean by these cage chord shapes, here's just a quick snippet from the intro to the cage system video in my course. Right now, we're just going to first go over the chords because that's the basis of the cage system is these chord shapes. So caged is an acronym, C-A-G-E-D, and that stands for these five basic open chords, the C chord, the A chord, the G chord, the E chord, and the D chord. So C, let's say I pretend my finger is the nut, right? Like that. Then it looks like this. So that's a basic C chord, but I put my first finger right behind the nut. So now I'm changing the fingering. And with this shape, C is right there. It's on the A string. So this shape has an A string root, and then we go to our left, right? So now, Let's say I want to play a G chord with this shape. I'm going to slide the whole shape to the note G on the 10th fret of the A string. And now I'm going to actually press down that bar. So watch, I'm going to play C to G like this. So what I just showed there using the C shape as an example, it's the same concept for all five shapes, C, A, G, E, and D. And the whole thing is just know where your root notes are in those open position chords, and then move that whole position so that that root note is now on a different note. So these five basic major chord shapes are the basis of the cage system. Then we can modify certain notes in those chords to make minor chords, seventh chords, sus chords, etc. And then there's also your surrounding pentatonic and diatonic scales that you could always access to embellish the chords and add little melodies like Frashanti does, which we see in Under the Bridge. If you want to go more in depth on the cage system and just generally understanding how harmony works on the fretboard, how you can construct and play chords and scales all over the neck, and what it means to play within a key, relative major and minor, modes, triads, taking regular chords, turning them into seventh chords, ninth chords, sus chords, all that good stuff, check out my 12 unit step-by-step -step fretboard mastery program. I do it both as a live course three or four times a year where you're with 40 other students and you're in Zoom sessions with me 
me once or twice a week, depending on your schedule. And there's also a self-paced version of the course, which is half price, but you don't get that kind of classroom, college-like experience. But whatever works for you, links are in the description. Hope to see you there. All right, so now I'm going to read you what John had to say about each section, and we'll go a little more in depth on what's happening in each section, some of the techniques, and some tips. All right, here we go. It starts here where Guitar World asks, your mastery of the Jimi Hendrix R&B style of rhythm guitar, earmarked by arpeggiated broken chords, movable small chord voicings, voice leading, and single note figures, is clearly illustrated in Under the Bridge. How did you learn to play in that style? So this is the one question that John's answer is actually on video. So let's check out what he has to say. I guess for, for me, for me, I, I mean, I really associate that playing with Jimi Hendrix, but, um, and that's, that's where I learned it from. Um, when I was a little kid and I heard Little Wing, I remember, I remember going, to, going to some like Indian, some, in Florida at the summer, I went to some Indian get together, picnic, or they had like an Indian band, it was on an Indian reservation, and the band there played Little Wing, and, and I remember I thought about it a lot and I decided that nobody could possibly know how to play Little Wing, like I, I felt like I felt like that it's it's in the you know category of impossible to play, you know, like like and and I saw this guy play it and I just couldn't believe my eyes. Like this this guitar player up there was was playing it and I, I felt I really felt like he was doing the impossible. So that that kind of playing it took me a while because it, it exists on so many levels. You've got the you've got the chord being played and then and then and then you've got a, a, a sort of a lead part going on on top of it and then you also get on top of the lead part these extra strings that are being barred that are on the high strings it ends up sounding to the ear of somebody who doesn't know how to play guitar it sound or somebody who's at a beginning stage is it it really sounds like it's like three guitars at once and that that was why little wing really had me confused because i thought how could that be one guitar it sounds like three guitars you know but I guess that where Jimmy was getting that style from was Curtis Mayfield. It was the, from what I understand, the originator of that style of, of rhythm guitar playing. And so you know, his his work in the Impressions and all his great solo records and everything, it was real innovative stuff. And I know it was a big influence on on Jimi Hendrix's playing. <laughs> So in my opinion, Little Wing is like a fountainhead for guitar technique and guitar style. I spent like three months learning how to play it note for note, exactly how it is on the album to the best of my ability. And I actually have a lesson on that and the link is in the description, so check that out. All right, then Guitar World says, can you show us how to play the intro to Under the Bridge? And Frashanti says, Sure. As I alternate between the D and F sharp chords, I keep all of the notes of each chord fretted as much as possible so that they ring into each other, and I use finger picking so that each individual note rings out clearly. When I recorded the song for the album, I overdubbed a pair of sustained high notes, but when I play the song live, I incorporate the first high note, D, into the primary part. So let's see what he's talking about. So when he says, I hold out each note of the chord so that they ring out. So when we go, all the notes sustain the entire time as opposed to going, right? In that case, the, I'm killing the note as soon as I play it basically. But instead we're having them ring out into each other, right? So they, it creates the sound of a chord. So to ensure that that's happening with your right hand, make sure you're not touching other strings while you're picking the string you're picking because that will mute the other strings. So you just want to be careful to only touch the string you're going for.
Now, personally, I find it easier to put my pinky down just to plant my hand. And then the same thing on the F sharp chord. All right, so then Guitar World asks him about something that I did not just do. They say, I noticed that when you go back to the F sharp chord the second time, you use your thumb to fret the low F sharp note. Six string, second fret. Frushanti says, Yeah, I mean, for me, I think using my thumb definitely has a lot to do with the way it sounds when I do it, um, because it gives my fingers a lot more freedom. For me, like, I could never play this chord that way. It just, it would be too limiting for me. I, there's only so much you can do from there. And, and when your thumb's taking care of that, you have a lot of freedom here. And like, like so, so that, for me, that's a big part of playing that style, like especially on, on Danny California, where it's, where I'm, that thumb is reaching those, those notes, you know, like, you know, it's, it's like, it just couldn't be done if you tried to do it this way, you know. So in the intro, as he played it, it's not crucial to play this F sharp chord like this, which is what Guitar World's talking about. So you see him switch back and forth between the two. But you see that after he goes from this, then he goes to the thumb after the slide up from the D to the E. But you could just as easily to me that's actually easier what is unconventional about the way he plays this f sharp major chord with his thumb is that even for thumb over players like hendrix they often skip the a string so that it just goes from string six four three two one but for Shanti, goes all six strings. He he plays sometimes, even with the thumb over. So depending on what kind of guitar you have, this could be easier or harder. I purposefully, whenever I replace a nut, which I think I have on almost every guitar I've ever played regularly, I always put Graph Tech Tusk XL nuts because I find there's less friction than like a bone nut. Um, I off-center it so that the low E string is very close to the edge. And I find that makes it really easy to grab the low E string. Whereas if the string is a little further away from the edge, you have to reach down a little further. So mine's really close to the edge and I could just pull back just a tiny little bit to get that note. But experiment with seeing just how little you actually need from the thumb to get that note. Right? And, and once you grab it, you're going to want to just pull back just a little bit. Because you don't want to push it down or else it'll go sharp like this. Right? You want to just grab it and pull back a little bit. But not too much or it'll go sharp because you're putting too much pressure. So you want to experiment with how little effort you need to get the desired effect. So that's what John had to say about that opening section, but I want to talk a little bit more about what's going on. So as far as what key we're in, the way that I see it is we're switching between F sharp minor and F sharp major as parallel modes. So for instance, the only key that has a D and an E major chord is either A major or F sharp minor. Those are relative major and minor, same key. Also, the two single note riffs are both F sharp minor scale riffs. The only time he modifies that F sharp minor key is to hit the major third on the F sharp to suddenly turn it into a major chord. So he's going between the sound of F sharp minor and then F sharp major, parallel modes. So everything he plays in this intro, besides the F sharp major chord itself, screams F sharp minor is all purely in the key of F sharp minor. For instance, like the D chord is the flat six major in the key of F sharp minor, and the E is the flat seven major. See, it would sound really natural to go back to F sharp minor. Right, or even A, which is the relative major key 
of F sharp minor. Right, that's kind of like a typical kind of chord progression in the key of F sharp minor or A. But what he does, he takes that F sharp minor chord and makes it major by just taking the minor third and making it a major third. Right? What else screams F sharp minor when we go? That's literally after the D. That's straight down the F sharp minor scale. And this note, A, when he plays the chord, he replaces with an A sharp. So F sharp minor, F sharp minor, F sharp major, right there. Okay, so that's one of the cool things about the intro. There's this ambiguity between major and minor. If you want to see another chord progression that does a similar thing, check out uh, Best Part, four chord song by her and Daniel Caesar. Modern song came out a few years ago. I've got a lesson on that where I also talk about using parallel major and minor. So now let's hear what John had to say about the verse. So Guitar World asks, how do you play the verse section of Under the Bridge? And Frashanti says, like this, for the majority of this section, I simply strum each chord and allow it to ring. The only exception is the occasional C-sharp minor chord, which I slide up to while fretting only the A and D strings. But sometimes he doesn't hit the root, you know, he's got flea to hit the root notes on the bass. So here, to me, it's not crucial yet to do thumb over. You could just as easily, and the way that I would play it is... as opposed to. Especially the minor, I find the minor form much harder than the major because you gotta bar uh, more with the index finger there. And then the other thing he says is that during that verse, he just slides up to the C-sharp minor chord just using that double stop, the fifth on the A string and the root on the D string. So one thing that he didn't do is play with a metronome. So you just want to make sure that you have this rhythm right. So where it comes in on the beat. Here's the rhythm. If this is one, two, three, four, it's bomb, 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 bomb. So I'm going to count and play at the same time. And I'm going to count one and two and three because some of the chords are hit on the end or the upbeat. One and two and three and four and 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 one more time, a little slower. One and two and three and four and one and two and Cool. And then as far as the theory on this progression, now we're in the key of E. And we were in the key of F sharp minor, which is the key of A. So if you look on the circle of fifths, those are the relative major and minor. They're the same key, basically. Same seven notes, same chords. F sharp minor and A major, right? So this, even though I said that's the F sharp minor scale, that's also the A major scale. There's the A. Right? That sounds like A major, but then if I just go down two notes to the sixth chord degree, that's the relative minor, F sharp minor. So if I tonicize that F sharp within those seven notes, it sounds minor. But then if I decide to instead tonicize the A, then it sounds major, but same seven notes. It's just an ear trick. We're just hearing the notes differently in relation to a different starting note. That's what relative modes are. Okay, so then the most natural key change is to just go one notch in the circle of fifths. So from A to E, 
that's up a fifth, right? And that chord E, you know, was in the key of A. It's the five chord in the key of A. So if we make the five chord the new one chord, that's a really natural feeling uh, key change. And that's what happens here. So we go to the key of E. And then we play the pop progression. So now we're totally diatonic, no parallel major minor. This is the most common chord progression in pop music. One, five, six, four. So the first time through, he plays one, five, six, three, four. But the three, the G sharp minor, is just like an approach chord. And then the second time, just one, five, six, four. So it goes one, five, six, three, four, one, five, six, four. If you want to see exactly how common this chord progression is, check out the Axis of Awesome comedy troupe did a bit called Four Chord Song, and they play like 60 different songs in a row as a compilation that all use the same chord progression. There's also a Wikipedia page, so I'll link that in the description. Then Guitar World says, you hit the guitar in a very percussive way with the picking hand, which makes this rhythm part sound more powerful. Frushanti says, as far as hitting it, I guess, um, I guess it just comes from years of doing it. It's not something that I've ever really thought about that much. I know, I know the, the ability to, to, uh, to, to block the strings that you don't want to be using with this hand rather than not picking them. I tend to pick all the strings and, and uh, if I don't want a certain note to ring through, I'll lift my finger up on it without lifting up all the way. And that's just something that it's second nature to me now, but I guess to somebody who's, who's starting, who's in their first couple of years of playing, it's really a good thing to start thinking about is, is, uh, is getting in the habit of, of, of picking all the strings. That way you can get really the, the, the real rhythmic kind of attack. And, um, and, then, and then with this hand, if you, if you, if you want to play a certain, the note that you would normally be just picking by itself, you, you, um, you, you basically block every other string from making a sound if you just want one string to sound through and you just get in the habit of, of muting the strings that you don't want to hear rather than not playing them. A good example of this technique happens in the second verse. There's a part where I switch from holding a chord to adding a little single note fill. I lightly lift the fingers off the previously held chord each time I play a little melodic riff. At this point, this technique has become second nature to me and I think it's a great one for guitarists to learn how to use. All right, so now he's talking about where he gets real Hendrixy, and I'll let the video speak for itself there, but I wanna offer you just a few tips about his style here, okay? So one is alternating between low notes and high notes in the chords. So like on the E, he's alternating between the root and the, and the fifth, and then the other root and the third. Right? And then going to the root and the fifth of the next chord. And the trill is the higher notes, right? So you're getting this kind of orchestral. And then as far as the embellishments you see him do on the E shapes, he does this note to this note, this note to this note, and this note to this note. So the main technique here to get those trills is use your pinky to hammer on and pull off. So if we take this chord right here, we lift up the pinky, and when we strike the G string, we're doing a quick hammer on and pull off. And then after we do that, we come back to the note of the chord that's on the next lowest string. Right? Now, same thing if I want to do it on the B string, right? But in that case, I'm going up two frets. Because these are notes of the surrounding pentatonic or diatonic scale. In this case, both, right? This goes from the third to the fourth, so that's a common move. This goes from the fifth to the sixth. And then lastly, the top string 
we go from the root to the second or the ninth. So we can go. Right, and this comes out of the Hendrix. Speaking of Little Wing, you know, the intro. So if you can't hold the chord quite like him, you could still do it, you know, traditionally like this. Right, so with this technique, you want to work on just your... And if you're doing it this way... Now, personally, I have a very hard time holding the thumb, getting the chord, and barring the index finger. So instead of barring the index finger flat, I usually use the tip of it to bar the top two strings. Now, Hendrix, he would skip over the A string a lot, as far as I've seen and learned, which makes it easy to play the major chord that way because I'm not playing the A string, so I don't need my pinky at all. For Shanti's way, like this, I find it a little more crowded and, and hard because he's playing all six strings, where with the Hendrix, we skip over the A string. Again, experiment with all these techniques. See if you can do those trills with a bar chord. You want to work on your accuracy, you know, hitting the string on the hammer on dead center. Don't always stare at it. See if you can just feel it. And then this way. Cool. All right. As far as putting together that entire part, you've got John's video. Fret Live and the slowdown feature on YouTube are a perfect pair. So use that slowdown feature. Like I mentioned in the intro, he plays the E chord two ways here. We've got this one, and then we've got the... So that's the G shape. One move you really want to practice is going between the, e, the A shape and the G shape. So if you do download the tab on Patreon, you also get access to twice weekly live guitar hangouts with patrons where we're all like the Brady Bunch on Zoom. We go over anything you want to go over as a patron, but we went over this in the last session, this song, and also going from the A shape to the G shape. So both of these are bar chords. In the A shape, you're barring the third finger, which to me, I like to swing the elbow out a little bit so that I can get a little bit of the side of that third finger. Sometimes I use my pinky too, probably most of the time. But then now we want to, this is scale degree one. Now we want to slide scale degree two to the third of the chord, like that. So from fret seven and then slide nine to 11. And now we're going to bar the same triad right here that we had here. So the G shape and the A shape share the same triad on strings two, three, and four. So you can go. So this would be like inspired by Frashanti. Now, once you're in the G shape, you have access to all these pentatonics. I was using as an example with the patrons was uh, Wind Cries Mary, the intro by Hendrix. What Hendrix does in that song is he starts with the A shape, but he puts the, the fifth in the bass on the low E string. And he goes up chromatically. In this case, I think it's an E flat, but I'm doing it in E. So I go E, F, F sharp. 
But then I use that same triad in the G shape. And I do this little hammer on. Now to go from the E shape to the G shape, look at my elbow. It swings out, swings in, right? Because I want this for the G shape and this for the A shape. So. And I want to be able to hit that third of the chord without interfering with the D string. So I bring my elbow out, which facilitates getting my ring finger to go straight in while the index finger bars. If my elbow's out, I can't really do that. That's personally my technique. Some people might be totally fine. Like for Shanti, we'd probably just go, right? The kind of grippy baseball back grip. For me, I'm more traditional with the wrist down, so I bring the elbow in as opposed to both could work. But anyway, you want to practice transitioning from So you play the A shape and then you slide up to get to the G shape. So So those are a couple little gems from that section as far as the particulars. You've got the fret live video from John. Then Guitar World says, how do you play the pre-chorus? Frashanti says, for this section, I combine muted strums with high chord voicings. To sound the muted strums, I lightly lay my fretting fingers on the strings without pressing down to the fretboard. So there, when he goes, to get that chord to ring short, you just release pressure, but don't take your fingers off the chord. Right, so that that's an essential part of funk guitar. So just take that F sharp minor chord and just practice going mute, ring. Now he does all down strums, same concept. Now I like to mute the low E string with the tip of my index finger, where John's more muting with his thumb. Again, I'm more wrist down, so whatever works for you. Now the way that he plays that B chord is wild to me. I think his fingers are like double jointed or something. I could do it, but it feels really uncomfortable to bar the 11th fret and then sneak that pinky in there without muting the E string. So one thing you could do is just play the top triad and not the D string, or just leave out the E string and play the power chord. Moving on to the last section, Guitar World asks, the interlude of Under the Bridge is reprised for the last chorus and outro. How do you play the basic part? For Shanti says, this part is relatively simple. I don't play any low root notes on any of the first four chords Instead, I put the fifth on the bottom, fretted on the A string. The interlude concludes with an unusual chord voicing for F major 7. It's played like a standard 8th position F bar chord, but I reach up to the 12th fret on the high E string with my pinky to add the major 7th E. I use the same voicing for G major 7 in the next bar. All right, so for this part now, we are moving again to parallel modes, A major, A minor. Is it A major, is it A minor? So the progression starts with an A major, but then once it goes to the A minor, then the rest of the chords are in the key of A minor. So it starts with the major one chord, A, to the minor one chord, A minor, to the major flat seven, G, to the major flat six, F. Now in a way, we're going full circle back to the beginning, because remember, the beginning was in the key of F sharp minor, which is A major. It's the same key signature. Here's a circle of fifths again, right? And now we're going back to A major, but then we're switching from A major to A minor for the bulk of the progression. So this is the second time we change keys in the song. It's the third key of the song. Pretty cool. Like John said, he's putting the fifth as the lowest note, but we do hear him play the root a little bit in this playthrough. Um, probably just because Flea's not there, so he figured, let me play the root note. That's with the root. But if we just start with the fifth, it's less boomy, more open sounding. 
Now he's letting the high E string ring out as well. Okay, then it's as if we're in A minor because then we go down to the flat seven major, which is the chord G. And this is a G6 because we have the E ringing out on the top. And we just go between the open B string to the third fret of the B string, which is the, the B is the third of the chord and the note D is the fifth of the chord. So it's a G6 either way. But now we go to an F major seven sharp 11 or F major seven add sharp 11. But then just to a regular F major seven, the sharp 11 is the open B string. And then the note C is just the fifth of the chord. So if we're in the key of A minor, which is C major. And we want to take the F chord, which is the four chord, and add a seventh, it's a major seven. But if we want to add an 11, it's a sharp 11. So that sharp 11 might seem like something weird, but in the key of C or A minor, if we think about C, F is the four chord. The fourth mode of C major is F Lydian. The characteristic of F Lydian is a sharp four interval. It's like the major scale, but it has a sharp four. So if we look at the key of C, but starting on F, and we think of F as one, F, G, A, B, the note B is a sharp fourth relative to F. And if we add that to the chord, we call it a sharp 11, natural to the key over the F chord. All right, then he goes up to this really cool F major seven, which is just a regular F major in the A shape, but adding the major seventh on the top with the pinky. That's what he was talking about there. Then he does E dominant seven. Remember we're in the key of A, so this is the five chord. Dominant seven. And instead of the pinky being up two frets from where the ring finger is, it's a flat seven on a dominant seven chord. So then it's just up one fret. But then he goes G major seven. Now this chord is non-diatonic because if we're in A major, then there is no G major seven. If we're in A minor, there's a G seven, but there's no G major seven. But who cares? Sounds good. <laughs> Then he goes back, back into that section, but adds some of those Hendrixisms, right? And then that cool little thing, one, three, one, open. All right, everybody, I hope you enjoyed that lesson. If you do know of any really great videos on YouTube of players that you love that are either playing something amazing or trying to teach something amazing, but it's still kind of hard to follow because they don't have all the amazing teaching resources that are continually being developed. Pow Music's contribution there with Fret Live. So if you find the Fret Live really valuable, and you find a video that you would like for us to add that to, please let us know in the description. Have fun, happy playing, and I'll see you in the next lesson. Thanks for watching this video on Power Music. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment down in the description. I hope you had a great rest of the day. Bye! Thank you. See you guys next time. Before I go, I'd like to extend a special thanks to the following upper tier POW Music patrons. William Creighton, Andrew Gunthart, Bill Laborde, Boomer Dell, Brad Tomlin, Bruce Yell, Chris Freeman, Dave Hubner, David McPherson, Derek Mickle, Don Stringham, Donald James Grass, Fred Locke, Joff Weatherwax, Jake Martin, James, hey. Jay Brilliant, Jesse Jacobs, Joe Prangle, John Barnes, John Bunyan, John Cushman, Jonas, Joseph McCarthy, Kay Carter, Kent Gresson, LW, Michael L, Michael Varney, Minor Pentatonic, Mu Jang, Nicholas Steinkamp, Patrick Bennett, Paul Davies, Randy Wallingford, Randy Yoakum, Scott Lee, 
Sean Ellis, Steve C., Stephen Pisano, Trampus Thompson, William Sitko, and all of the rest of the Pal Music patrons. Thank you so much for your ongoing support. Happy playing, and I'll see you guys next time. <laughs>